Our title today is, When God Makes You Go Wow. Now and again, God takes your breath away. He stops you in your tracks and makes you go, wow. So let me ask you, what makes you go wow? What sort of things just stop you like that and make you Almost like you can't help yourself, but a sort of a, a wow comes out of your mouth without even having to think about it. Just, you know, what, what sort of things do that for you, would you say? Let's have a bit of sharing here. Yeah? Something unexpected. Okay. What was it? A rainbow. I saw a double rainbow recently. Fantastic, yeah? Sunrise itself is beautiful. Stars in the, st in the sky. Yeah? There's a hand over there. When someone does something wonderful for somebody, you just stand back in, in that. Yep. Yeah. Nature in general. The birth of a child. Birth of a child. Wow. Anna? For no reason. David Attenborough program. I saw it last night. Yeah. Yeah, that beautiful, I mean, that, those reds and blues and greens that no one will ever see. Just, and you go, wow, when you see it, what a privilege, actually, to be able to see these things. Anything else? All the blessings in our lives. Thank you. The variety in the human race. And the fact that most of the time, we don't kill each other. <laughs> most of the time, at least around here anyway. But no, the, the sheer variety, Sonia. There's very, very specific prayer. Okay, you pray something very specific and it gets answered. And even though you prayed it in faith, it's still a wow when it happens, isn't it? Yeah. Right, logically something's not going to happen, but then God comes through. Sarah. Transformation. Transformation. Right, yeah. Slightly more shallow, but when South Africa went four one cuts. I lost what you think is wow. It's that it's that one point. It's that one point. Yes indeed. Lots of things make us go wow, right? I um on, on the slides, if, you're, if you have them, you will see a picture of my granddaughter. Aha, that's a wow. Yeah. That's my favorite picture of her so far. She's just over two months old. And uh, that was WhatsApp to me by my daughter. And I made it my, you know, put it on my, on my phone, you know, as my wallpaper, you know, as she is right there. And every time I see it, honestly, every time I, I turn my phone on, I'm like, wow, that's mine. <laughs> well, it's my daughter's, but you know, I mean, but I, and there are just moments like that. I, two Saturdays ago, I was asked to go and do a workshop for the students in the London campus ministry of our London congregation, that some of you were part of back in the day. And uh, I went to do this workshop and it was a great time. We had like three hours of, of study together. And at the end of it, we were having some fellowship and I had a bunch of uh, people around me, three student women, and they were asking me some advice about Bible software, because I'd been mentioning it in the uh, like workshop, and I said, well, I'll show you what I have on my phone. And I, so I tapped my phone to show them the app I use, and up came the picture of my granddaughter, Talia, and they all went, wow. And then one of them said, oh, your daughter. <laughs> <laughs> wow, someone thinks I'm young enough to have a daughter that's that age. Wow. <laughs> yeah, then, then they put their glasses on. But, um, you know, there's some things like this that, that God takes our breath away. God makes us step back and think there's something else going on here. Because in the world around us, I don't know about, well, as Bianca mentioned earlier, you know, if you pay any attention to the news, because I'd advise us to pay as little as we can in some ways, but anyway, enough to know what to pray about, um, we should pay attention to. But 
Yeah, when you look at the conflicts in the world today, still going on in Ukraine or in the Middle East right now, uh, the environmental crisis that really is a crisis, uh, personal challenges that we have that are really almost debilitating sometimes. They take everything away, take your energy away. There's so many things like that going on. And the thing about that is it, all these things, if we're not careful, obscure God's wowness from us. We lose that wowness, awareness of God if we're not careful. And you and I are not going to solve the Middle East problem. I, I don't think it's going to be anybody here. Maybe it will be. Maybe God will do that through you. But I don't think so. I don't think you and I have control over, we certainly don't have control over Putin, let alone many other things in this world. And, and many of the challenges that we have in our lives, we have very limited control over, right? The one thing that we have, I don't know that control is the right word, but the one thing that we have influence over that's ours is the ability to capture or recapture or refresh the wowness of God for us. And I believe that that is the best anxiety antidote we can find. The world needs anxiety antidotes. And, um, and my wife's a doctor and, and often some of that is medication and various medical treatments and that's fine. We, we appreciate the people who have those skills. But ultimately for our soul, for our deep, deep in our spirit, we, we need a God, we need to know and to be aware of a God that makes us go wow. That's our anxiety antidote. Um, anxieties will not be ultimately sold by sorting everything out because, uh, newsflash, not, not everything will get sorted out in this life. It won't be achieved by knowing, it, won't be achieved, it will only be achieved by knowing that God is present, that he's at work, and that he's trustworthy. And so I hope that today as we look at Psalm 65, this will help us to be refreshed in our awareness of and our gratitude for God's wowness. So let's read the psalm, and then I want to introduce Divan to do his testimony as part of this lesson. So, uh, but let's, let's first of all read through Psalm 65. Psalm 65. Praise awaits you, our, our God in Zion. To you our vows will be fulfilled. You who answer prayer. Someone mentioned that. To, to you all people will come. When we were overwhelmed by sins, you forgave our transgressions. Blessed are those you choose to bring near to live in your courts. We are filled with the good things of your house, of your holy temple. You answer us with awesome and righteous deeds, God our Savior, the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas, who formed the mountains by your power, having armed yourself with strength, who stilled the roaring of the seas, the roaring of their waves, and the turmoil of the nations. The whole earth is filled with awe at your wonders, where morning dawns, where evening fades, you call forth songs of joy. You care for the land and water it. You enrich it abundantly. The streams of God are filled with water to provide the people with grain, for so you have ordained it. You drench its furrows and level its ridges. You soften it with showers and bless its crops. You crown the year with your bounty, and your carts overflow with abundance. The grasslands of the wilderness overflow. The hills are clothed with gladness. The meadows are covered with flocks, and the valleys are mantled with grain. They shout for joy and sing. Our God is a whale. He answers prayers. He listens to our prayers. And he forgives our sins. And in that connection, I'll ask Divan to come up and share about how God brought him to himself. Um, so my walk with Jesus has been from, I can remember, my parents took me every Sunday to church um, since a toddler. Um, every Friday night, went to Kids Kingdom, went to um, teen events. So for me, my background is knowing Jesus and knowing him and I thought he was always part of my life and I thought I knew him really well. I thought we were like best friends growing up. Um, but fast forward to 2016, I went to my first year of university 
And I think there I realized my relationship with God was not what I thought it was. Um, so I went to a different university than all my friends did and made a lot of new friends, which wasn't the best influence on my life because um, I think most of them were non-believers. Most of them were just people I knew in primary school growing up with. We lived in the same area. So I've always known them and just had a good time with them. And them not being believers, we took a slightly different path in doing things that we don't want to, or that you don't want to do. So every Friday night we went out, we had a good time, we smoked weed, we, we did stuff that looking back on now, I'm not proud of, but I'm proud of it being part of my story. Um, and then in the same year, in 2016, my parents moved to churches. Um, the reason they moved churches is because the church we were part of started baptizing kids and um, or babies. And my dad just felt very strongly that's against the teachings of the Bible that kids can't get, or babies can't get baptized as they don't have an idea what baptism is. Um, so at the new church, I just felt very alone because previously I was so involved in teen ministry, I was involved with the sermons and everything, where now the closest person in age was either five years older than me or five years younger than me, and I was just floating. Um, so there was a big void in my life where I just felt empty and alone, and that void transferred to university as well, as all my friends wanted to do things that I felt peer pressure to do because I wanted to have friends. I wanted to be part of a, a group. Um, and in that, there was just this divide inside of me, this loneliness growing every single day. But I didn't know about it. Um, I felt the pain but couldn't put it to any real feelings. Um, and that continued through the year of 2016. Um, 2017 comes along and I'm like, all right, I'm going to try and change my, my life, going to try and sort it out. And I made a deal with myself in the beginning of 2017 to get baptized. Um, but I had no clue what baptism was. It was like almost a New Year's resolution, but had just no idea what it was. I knew it was something to do with your walk with um, God and your relationship with Jesus and Christ. But I just thought it's a symbol of something. Um, so I was like, okay, let's try and figure out. And in that path, um, I was also training for a mountain bike race with one of my friends. Um, and one Sunday in March of 2017, we were training, and his father was like, you want to come to our church? As their church started at 10 o'clock, and mine usually started at 8. So I missed mine, and I was like, yeah, why not? I'll come with you guys. Let's go to church, have a good time. So I sat in the service, and straight after the service, his mom introduced me to the campus minister, whose name is Jacques. Um, and he took my number and straight away said, hey, you want to come out to Bible Talk Tuesday night? And I'm like, okay, yeah, well, why not? I'm, I'm curious. I want to go see where this goes. Um, on the Tuesday night, go to Bible Talk, and it was just amazing. Um, I think that is definitely where my heart started to shift. I met a group of people that was just filled with joy, filled with love, wanting to know God, wanting to open up His Word and learn from Him. And I was like, this is a bit different than what I'm used to. Used to only one or two people wanting to learn from Christ. And there was everyone in the group there wanting to learn. Um, and on that same evening, the Tuesday night, Jock was like, hey, you want to do one-to-one um, -one Bible studies? You know, um, we can just open up the Word and get to know God a little bit better. And that was, I was like, yeah, let's do it. And that was a Thursday. Meanwhile, in the back of my mind, I'm like, yeah, we're going to go to the Bible study. I'm going to share some scriptures. He's going to share some scriptures. We're going to look at stuff. I'm going to quiz him. He's going to quiz me. Um, and I got there, and he opens up the, the Word, and we do the Word study, and he just starts showing me passages, and I'm like, wait, I've, I've never seen this. Like, what, what, is, what, what are you showing me? Is this actually in the Bible? Um, so I was a little bit, like, not scared, but I was taken aback. Like, my entire life I've grown up thinking I'm knowing the Word and knowing Jesus, but actually not taking my own time and, and studying the Bible. And he just opened up a few scriptures that, showed me that this book in front of me is God, you know. Um, so we started the Bible studies in March, and in May I did my mountain bike race. I came back, um, and I was in that time we were studying, and I was doing my own um, quiet times in the morning. And the one Tuesday morning, I came across a scripture in Luke 9, verse 61 to 62, um, that says, um, it's the cost of following Jesus. It says, still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. 
And I just felt very confused reading this, and I'm like, wait, are you saying I can't go back and say goodbye to my family? Like, what does it mean? This is just throwing me completely off to, to what I know. Um, so that night we had Bible talk, and I went to Jacques um, after Bible talk, walking to my car, and I asked him, what, what does this mean? You know, I, I don't understand this specific meaning of this scripture, and he's just plain and simple told me, we can't have best of both worlds. We can't have one foot with Jesus and one foot in the world. Um, we need to make a choice. And at that moment, I, I can vividly remember telling him, I'm not yet ready to put both feet, or I'm not ready to give up the world. Um, and in that, he's like, let's, let's maybe take a break of the studies. He was going to America for, for a month um, to visit family. And I was like, I needed to understand what this meant for, my, for me in, in my life. Um, so that month went past. Um, he came back in July, uh, June, end of June, beginning of July. Um, and then we went on an uh, encounter retreat, which is the campus um, retreat for all the campus members in South Africa. There was about 80 to 100 campus students. Um, and in that time he was away, I just felt empty. I spent a lot of time with schools, friends from school and did stuff with them that just made me feel empty. It was, there was no desire to be spending time with them because everything that they did, I didn't enjoy. I didn't get joy from or felt encouraged or lifted up by. Um, so I went on the retreat and I think that was where my eyes completely opened. Um, I saw people just having this love for Christ that I can't explain. Um, people that have been through so many bad experiences in life and they just have this joy. And having conversations with them, the only way I could see they found the joy is from Jesus and from Christ, you know, that they have had a hard life, but through the cross, they were able to find a new life in Jesus and be um, restored by him and just have this courage and faith to carry on. And, and that was something I missed. That was something I, I was longing for. Um, and then that Sunday night after the camp went back home, I accidentally scrolled through a sermon of a person called Sadie Roberts, um, where she was doing a sermon on the Ten Virgins. Um, and that just got me to tears in the sense of that I don't want to be one of the foolish, one of the five foolish virgins being left behind, where Jesus stands at the door and says, I don't know you. When I heard that, it just made me, made me wet. Um, I, I didn't have words. All I knew is that the life I was living was not the life Jesus intended for me and was not the life that I can live to the fullest. If I keep going down that path, I would end up in a place where I don't know anything. You know? And I think that moment, it just clicked to me that everything I've been searching for is in God and isn't Jesus. And he is the way for me to to be able to be closer to God. Um, so after that, I called Jock and I'm like, hey, I'm, I'm ready to study again, go through everything. So we started all the Bible studies in August and then on um, the 3rd of October, 2017, I got baptized. I, um, I made the decision to make uh, Jesus Lord of my life and then just to commit my life to him. Um, and I think it was the best day in my life, but it was also, I might have had a perception that life would be fine afterwards. Um, and that's basically the start of the journey, knowing that there's going to be a lot of ups and downs afterwards and tough times, but God has made life just so much more fulfilling for me. Um, and without him, I can't do anything I've been able to do. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my story. Thanks, Devon. You know, uh, yeah, think about your, think about how you became a Christian. Just for a moment, just think about all the things that had to happen. All the things that had to go kind of right. The people that spoke to you at different points in your life. Um, a, an organization called Tear Fund did a survey a few years ago now asking people how many people were influential in you becoming a Christian, like at some point in your journey. And the average was very interesting. And I thought the number would be three or four. The average number of people that had an influence on someone to become a Christian through their life to the point where they became a Christian was 13. Now that's the average. That means for some it was just a few, it was a few. But for some it was 20, 30 people that at some point they talked to them, they prayed to them, their example said something to them. We, you know, God moves extraordinarily through people. 
And that speaks to our conversion, but it also speaks to the people that we have influence over. In that you could be not number one or number 13, you could be number seven. And you need to be, we need to be content with being number seven. We don't have to be the person that initiates or the person that finishes it off. We need to be uh, a servant of God and his spirit in the, li the lives of people in our families that we've been reaching out to for 30 years or our neighbors we've been living next to for 15 years and nothing's happened or those old friends from university that you're still in touch with on Facebook or somewhere and I don't know but we and all our kids that have grown up and family members we, we need to remember it's not just about you and me because it is God who wants to draw us close see God's passion for the lost is greater than yours and greater than mine that's why these things happen like the things that happen for Divan because God wants to draw him close you answer prayer to you all people will come all people you mentioned you know the diversity of the human race all people when we were overwhelmed by sins you forgave our transgressions blessed are those you choose and bring near to live in your courts we're filled with the good things of your house of your holy temple God wants us near you know, one of the ways to refresh your wowness around God is to tell someone your testimony. Whether it's somebody who's not a Christian or a Christian, frankly. Uh, we had dinner last week, my wife and I, with a woman called Valley, and she heads up the work of Hope Worldwide in Afghanistan. She's responsible for that, and she's a very inspiring person, working in very challenging circumstances. We had a wonderful dinner, talking to her about all the work going on over there, but then she asked me how I became a Christian. And I told her the story, and I got all weepy. My eyes started, I mean, I cried. And uh, she said, why, why are you crying? As in, not like you shouldn't be, like what's wrong with you, but just what is it that's caused you to be so emotional? And I had to stop for a minute and think about it. I said, I think it's just, I'm remembering a time when I was so aware of God wanting to be with me, God doing something in me. God became such a real thing, thing person, you know, act, power in in my life at that time and it's taking me back there it's refreshing me and one of the things that will help you and me to retain our wowness is to remember that he has of god is to remember that he forgave our transgressions and one of the ways to to really palpably uh, what's the word viscerally to, to make it real to you again because for some of us it was a long time ago is to tell somebody else your testimony of how god changed your life that's our first point. God yearns for our nearness. That is the God that we love and serve. The second thing from the psalm is just about the strength that he has. You know, one of the things about God is that he is ultimately strong, right? Uh, he is stronger than you or I, and he is fundamentally, uh, fundamentally, he has the strength that you don't have and that I don't have. I don't know about you, I would like to feel stronger in my spiritual life. I would like to feel like I'm, you know, tip-top condition all the time. I would like to feel like, Satan, bring your worst, I can handle it. I mean, this is how I'd like to feel. I don't think it would be good for me. Where would be my, my dependence on God be? But I would like that strength. But the point is not your strength or my strength. And this is a very reassuring and important point for us as Christians. Fundamentally, your relationship with God and you making it to heaven is not dependent fundamentally on your strength. It's dependent on God's strength and us connecting with that strength. It's, that's why we have the Holy Spirit, at least in part. It's because that, it is he who gives us the strength to live the Christian life. Uh, we see the strength mentioned here in some ways uh, in this song. Uh, this is our God who does awesome and righteous deeds, who formed the mountains by his power. He armed him, he, uh, having armed yourself with strength, so God has this strength, he stilled the roaring of the seas, the roaring of the waves, the turmoil of the nations. The whole earth is filled with awe at your wonders. And I do need that now and again, like that, that television program that I think Anna mentioned. Now and again, I need to watch David Attenborough or somebody. I, I need to. I mean, I really like those programs, but actually I really need something like that from time to time. I need to see those bizarre creatures that live at the bottom of the ocean, uh, that I think God has a really interesting imagination to create those. Or I need to get in touch with the vastness of space or something. I, 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 I need that. I saw a kingfisher recently. Where I live, there's a, a little river and a canal, and now and again, you get a, cat, a, a catch a glimpse of this flash of electric blue as it flew under the bridge that I was walking across and down the river. I, I need to see that now and again. Um, the Greenland shark. You know about the Greenland shark? 
I heard this recently on an a, a audio book I'm listening to about the oceans. Uh, the Greenland shark is an astonishing shark. It doesn't reach sexual maturity until it's 150 years old. Uh, uh, 150 years old. Imagine a teenager having to wait that long. Um, <laughs> doesn't reach sexual maturity until it's 150 years old. The oldest specimen they found is, of this shark is 400 years old. And they just float through the oceans permanently. I mean, they never, never land anywhere, never stop anywhere. They're just permanently floating, swimming, 400 years old. That means that the one they found um, was only becoming an adult at the time of the American Revolution. Something has been swimming in our seas already for a, a while before that and since then and I mean this I mean this is astonishing right so yes you go wow right and this is why we need to get in touch with this stuff because it reminds us God God did that and it wasn't even a big deal for God right the British biologist JBS Haldane said the universe is not stranger than we imagine it is stranger than we can imagine it really is Trillions of galaxies in the observable universe. Trillions of galaxies. Maybe about two trillion in the observable universe. Maybe. I got these numbers off the internet, so of course they're true. <laughs> Check them if you wish. Ask David and Amanda Kaner. They are the numbers people in my life. Something like, in terms of stars, and I don't understand this number, all right? Somebody here might be able to. Again, in the observable universe, it is estimated that there are something like a hundred sextillion stars. I don't know how many that is, really. It's a lot. It's a lot, right? And to God, this is something he creates. This is something he can wrap up. This is something he understands. Our God is a wow. What is it about nature or this world around us that helps you understand better the wowness of God? I would suggest that you think about that. And maybe what you might like to do is do something like write down your top 10 wow facts list. You know, a list of things that are just so astonishing that when you read through them, you think, yeah, yeah, it's, it's a wow. God is a wow. Maybe put some down in a list and keep it somewhere. Meditate on the God who made these things and established them and, and maintains them and pray some gratitude prayers that he has the strength. And when we consider that he has the strength for this, why do we doubt that he has the strength to give us for what's going on in our lives? This helps us so much. Finally, oh no, actually there's a scripture to go with this. Sorry, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Let's remember this in 1 Corinthians 6 that I think is really helpful in terms of his strength, God's strength. Because all those things are in the observable physical universe. But what about outside of that? In 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and in, we'll pick it up in... Um, in verse 14, verse 14, by his power, by his strength, God raised the Lord from the dead and he will raise us also. He will raise us also. I really like David Attenborough's programs, but none of them are about people being raised from the dead to live a new life. God is beyond even the physical. He is stronger than death. Stronger than death. God is a wow. Finally, um, God provides. You know, one of the reasons we have a wow with God is that we know that he provides, and he actually provides more than we need. And you may say, well, no, he doesn't, because I haven't got enough money to pay my mortgage, so he does not. Okay, I, I understand there are temporary things in life that are like that, and they happen, and, and it's, it's challenging. It is. But the truth is, in this world, we have more than we need. I mean, most of us, most of the time, have more than we need. And God is the one who provides this, not always as much as we want, when we want it, or the kind that we want, but nonetheless, more than we actually need. The trouble is that abundance is never enough for human greed. I mean, God's abundance is never enough. I'm not talking here about some weird, you know, uh, the universe loves you and wants to give you everything. I'm not talking about that. But there is an abundance from God that is, it, it, it satis God's abundance satisfies where our greed never can. Overloading ourselves is not the same thing as enjoying abundance. It's important that we strip away the things that then allow God to be generous to us with the things that really matter. Our friendships, our love for one another and for God, our families, the things that are truly significant. And we have to get rid of the things that are too much to accept the things from God that are abundant and wonderful. 
He is the abundant God. As it says back in this passage, the psalm may be a harvest psalm. You can kind of feel that from, from it. You care for the land and water it. You enrich it abundantly. Streams of God are filled with water, providing the people with grain. You've ordained it, drenching its furrows, leveling its ridges. Uh, you crown the year with your bounty and your carts overflow with abundance. Is your cart, the cart of your life overflowing with abundance, the right kind of abundance? Not accoutrements and things that complicate our lives so much that we don't even know whether we're coming or going. And we get so anxious about our possessions, we, we forget about God. Not that kind of abundance. Uh, when I was a, a, when I graduated from university, I couldn't get a, a, a job I wanted, so I worked on a local farm. And uh, this local farm was a fruit farm and a potato farm and a few other things. And uh, it was a good time working on the farm. And I, I, I drove one of the tractors, and one of the things I had to do was drive the tractor from the farmyard up the narrow country lane in Kent, where I, where I was, uh, to the field, potato field somewhere distant, and get it loaded up and bring the potato harvest back to the yard where somebody else dealt with it. So I had this tiny little old tractor, an old Massey Ferguson, not a big thing like you see these days, but a little thing. And the trailer was quite big. And I drive it up this narrow lane and onto the potato field, and it got loaded up by whoever it was, and they put too much in it. And, and uh, that was the way. I mean, you're always trying to minimize the number of journeys, right? So they pile up the potatoes so that they're, they're like a mountain behind me in the trailer, right? So the, what that means is, and I have no mirrors on this tractor, and the, the, this is 1983, okay? Regulations were a bit different then. And there were no indicators at the back of the trailer or anything like that. So when I looked behind to see the traffic behind me, I could see nothing. The whole road was blocked. I couldn't see a thing. So I'm driving the tractor back down to the yard, and I'm going down a steep hill. And I do look back, and because I'm on a hill, I can see at the very top of the hill, quite a long way back, but I can see a car a long way back. And I think, okay, the car's a long way back. That's fine, and I'm trundling along. And I have to turn right to get into the yard. And the way I do this is, first of all, I look again behind me, and I, of course I can't see anything, just a mountain of potatoes. But I can't see the car. I think, well, it's probably just behind me waiting. So I held onto the steering wheel and leaned out like this, like, a, like as far as I, I could like that. Just hopefully he would see my hand around the side of the, the, the trailer, and nothing happened. So I turn in. And I turn, it's a bit of a narrow gap, and it's a right-hand turn, it's quite sharp, and so I'm, I'm really concentrating on getting the track to the right angle so the trailer will go in the right way. And as I get to the entrance, and I'm partway through, I look back, and there is a beautiful new BMW Sports Coupe wedged underneath the trailer. I'm dragging it in behind me. It's wedged. I, uh, I stopped the tractor, <laughs> and I got down. And uh, a rather angry man came out to have a chat with me from his, uh, from his BMW. Uh, he was Swiss, and part of the problem was it was left-hand drive, and so he didn't see my very clear hand signal, I think. Uh, but uh, he, basically, he tried to overtake me, and um, he'd wedged himself. And, and uh, fortunately, nothing too bad happened. But I, st I can tell you the story that, like I was there because of how how devastated I felt, I mean, how bad I felt about it all. The farmer was great. He just f filled in some forms and they dealt with it. I'm, I'm very grateful. Um, you know, fundamentally, the problem there is not tractors and potatoes or left-hand drive cars. The fundamental problem is there was an overabundance of potatoes in my, in my trailer. I couldn't see the car. Sometimes we have an overabundance of stuff in our lives. We can't see God. He's right there behind us. He's, I mean, he's close, right? We don't sense him close because... Too many potatoes. <laughs> Too many potatoes. And then we lose the wow of God. God is amazing. God provides everything we need. Let's go to John chapter 7 and remind us of this. Things I think most of us here would know and agree with. But, you know, we just need reminding every now and again. In John chapter 7, I know I do. In John 7 and uh, verse 37. On the last and greatest day of the festival... Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. And by this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. What a wonderful promise. We overflow with the Spirit. The Spirit needs a home. The Spirit needs a bucket to fill up so they can then overflow. Uh, and our buckets need to be empty enough for the Spirit to fill us up. 
And I'm not going to try and give you some kind of deep theological point there. It's more that we've got to create room for God in our lives to fill us up so that we can indeed overflow. Similar to my last point, what you might want to do is create your own list of your top gratitude wows for the wonderful things that God has blessed you with, has poured into your life. What has he given you? The top 10 wows of facts are things that God has done that are amazing. But what about the top 10 things of, of ways in which God has filled you up with himself? The things you're most grateful for that he has done in you and for you. Meditate on what God has provided. Pray some gratitude prayers. I am pretty sure it will help you recall God's wowness. God is a wow. God wants to draw us near. That's a wow. Why would a pure and holy God want us with him? But he does. God has the strength that you don't and I don't. So that's a wow because he provides the strength. And God, has, God provides more than we need. God is so generous. That's a wow. And the biggest wow of all, Luke 22. Let's turn there and we'll finish and then we'll take communion together. Luke 22. The biggest wow of all is going back to what Divan shared and what the psalm talks about, where it talks about God forgiving our sins, redeeming us. And in Luke 22, Jesus said this in verse 17. Let's, let's pick it up there. Taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The wow is that Jesus gave us his life, his body and his blood. And that is the wow that we celebrate every time we take bread and wine, every time we come together as a fellowship in our larger or smaller groups. We celebrate God as the wow God who gave us his son. When we take bread and wine, we're going to sing the song Beautiful. And this song really sums up many of the themes from Psalm 65. I see your face in every sunrise. The colors of the morning are inside your eyes. The world awakens in the light of the day. I look up to the sky and say, you're beautiful. You're a wow, God. I see your power in the moonlit night where planets are in motion and galaxies are bright. We are amazed at the light in the light of the stars, it's all proclaiming who you are. You're beautiful. You're a wow. I see you there hanging on a tree. You bled and then you died and then you rose again for me. Now you are sitting on your heavenly throne. Soon we will be coming home. You're beautiful. You're a wow. When we arrive on eternity's shore where death is just a memory and tears are no more, We'll enter in as the wedding bells ring. Your bride will come together and we'll sing, you're beautiful. And we'll say, wow, I'm here. Wow. Let's pray together. Father, sometimes we actually don't have words we don't have the right words or we don't have the words to, 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 to respond to who you are adequately. And we praise you and we sing and we say thank you and we're in awe of you. But sometimes, Father, please help us to remember that you're just a wow. You're so different. You're not like us. Yet you care about us. You want us close. You have the strength to bring us close. You have overcome sin and the grave. You are the generous God who's poured out your spirit to us and into us. And you give us forgiveness. And we thank you that the ultimate gift was Jesus. And we pray that as we take this bread and wine, that remembering him would strengthen us to live a life of love, a life of, a life of discipleship to Christ for the blessing of people in this world. We pray that this time together to strengthen us to be your ambassadors in the world in the week to come. In Jesus' name. Amen.